In this week's podcast, we talked to actor Eric Ladden, who has recently been captivating us playing Chris Craft in The Right Stuff on Disney+. Plus. We'll be wrapping up our thoughts on that show as well as bringing you up to date in the world of spaceflight. Our weekly request, please follow us on at Space and Things 1 on Twitter or get involved at Space and Things Podcast on Facebook and Instagram or leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. We really do love to hear from you, so please do get in touch. But right now, it's time for episode 13 of the Space and Things Podcast. You're listening to the Space and Things Podcast with Emily Carney and Dave Giles. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 13 of our podcast. This uh, should be a fun episode. I'm excited about this one, Emily. Yes, yes, we do have a special guest star this week. This is really cool, so I'm really excited too. Uh, yeah, we... we <laughs> I'm afraid of saying this. Yeah, we finally got hot Chris Craft on our show. So that's pretty awesome. We got hot Chris Craft. <laughs> yeah, we stayed up extra late last Wednesday to make sure that happens. And uh, you'll hear more of that later on. Uh, but I, I, there's so much to talk about this week, Emily. I think we should just crack on. Yes, I agree. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir. Reading it loud and clear. Another crazy week in space. Uh, let's start last Thursday night all the way over in New Zealand, where Rocket Lab had their 16th successful launch of their Electron rocket, delivering 30 new satellites for a whole variety of different customers. Uh, the return to sender mission was also the first time they've recovered their first stage to reuse. Uh, although not as spectacular as what we see from SpaceX or Blue Origin, the booster landed safely in the ocean thanks to a parachute and is now back in the factory. And while this mission saw Electron take a soft water landing, Rocket Lab plans to recover stages from future missions by capturing the boosters with midair with a helicopter. Crazy. Uh, so as we talked about a few weeks back, the mission also carried an astronome. Uh, gaming icon Gnome Chomsky was successfully delivered to orbit and will remain attached to Electron's kick stage and will de-orbit with that when the stage burns up on re-entry into the atmosphere. Uh, the gnome belongs to Gabe Newell, who is the co-founder of the gaming company Valve, and he pledged to donate $1 to the Starship Foundation for every person who viewed the launch. And I believe over $250,000 were raised for the charity, which invests in impact programs designed to accelerate and deliver sustainable world-class health care for children in New Zealand. I love that story. Uh, I love the pictures of Noam Chomsky. It's amazing. It's pretty funny. Yeah, so good. So <laughs> I was good. Like, yeah, we, we finally got a gnome in space. Yeah. That's awesome. It, he's like the antithesis of Starman in, in Elon's Tesla as well. It's, it's, <laughs> it's such a funny comparison. I love it. All right. Um, unfortunately, we do have some sad news this week. Uh, the legendary Arecibo telescope will be closing for good after two of the supporting cables uh, have broken. Uh, this telescope in Puerto Rico was built in 1963 and was the world's largest radio telescope for decades. It was from uh, there where astronomers first sent an interstellar message, radio message, in uh, 1974, which I believe is uh, called the Arecibo message. Uh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> does, does what it says in the team. Right? Yeah, it does what it says. <laughs> wow. And um, it's also where the first extrasolar planet uh, was discovered. In uh, 1992, uh, it is very sad news. Uh, they also did a lot of radio, or uh, not just radio astronomy, radar astronomy there as well. Uh, and it's responsible for taking uh, really neat images of planets such as uh, Mercury and Venus, which were really not well explored. So um, Arecibo has really worked in concert with some of the world's uh, other observatories mm. and uh several spacecraft as well to get us some more data about a uh, solar system bodies and planets we don't we didn't really know about and uh it worked for 57 years which i think is uh which is actually pretty good of really course, if yeah, you yeah. think about of it course. that's that's a while yeah we we wouldn't expect our home computers to last that long that's for sure no not even not even close so i think they uh, they obviously had several upgrades during that time but um 
as I said, there were some amazing uh, innovations done there. So yeah. it's a pretty big loss. Yep. As, as always with these stories, there'll be more information in the show notes if you wish to have a look. But the photos of, of, uh, of this telescope, it's massive. So it's easy to see why it's so hard to fix or, or to do simple upgrades to. It's not as easy as, as you would think. But um, picking up the mood again, on Saturday, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Uh, the first stage landed just a short distance away from where the rocket launched. Uh, this was the first launch to space from the base since June 2019. But it seems there are some more launches planned from this site in the near future. It delivered the Sentinel-6 Michael Frelick Ocean Science Satellite, named after the American oceanographer who served as director of the NASA Earth Science Division from 2006 until his retirement last year. Uh, Vandenberg traditionally is used to insert payloads into a polar orbit, but recently SpaceX did do that from Florida, so... Um who knows how that's going to play out in the future. Um, the video of this launch was really wonderful. Uh, and when those first stages land on land, we're used to seeing them landing on the sea, on the barges at sea. But when they land on on the ground rather than the sea, we get such better views and, and arguably a better perspective of exactly how crazy it is that they're actually getting these things to land because you you've got some kind of context of how fast it's coming down. You can see something that you know that's fixed, which you don't often get from the from the viewpoints on the on the on the ocean. Absolutely. And I, I love seeing Vandenberg launches because uh, I've never seen a launch there in person yet, but uh I hope to someday. That's definitely on my list of things to do. I love seeing the footage of launches going up uh kind of amid the mountains oh, there exactly, and the hills. Yeah. I think that's really cool looking. Like I, I hope to experience one Someday, because I'm used to seeing it in like, you know, I'm standing in like a marsh with like you know, mud <laughs> yeah. and getting bit up by mosquitoes. <laughs> like that's what I'm used to. So I'd like to get the uh, Vandenberg experience someday. Yeah, it's, it's completely different when you're watching that, that, uh, that video from, from the mission. So again, that'll be, in, that'll be in the show notes. All right. And some exciting news from China on Monday. Uh, they launched their largest rocket, which is the Long March 5, carrying the a uh, Chang'e 5 spacecraft. I may have not said that correctly, so if I didn't, somebody please yell at me. Um, it is on its way to the moon, where it seeks to collect lunar material and bring it back to Earth. Uh, this is the first such mission from Earth since the Soviet Union's Luna 24 mission in 1976, and hopefully uh, this mission will be a success and we'll get some great visuals from it over the next few weeks. There's a reason why I wanted you to... Uh to deliver that piece of news, Emily. <laughs> there was, I think it's Chang, <laughs> Chang, um, Chang'e or Shang'e yeah, I, or something like that. E even if I had it said to me a zillion times, I'm still going to get it wrong. Uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, just one final thing. Uh, that is a great bit of news. That really, like, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes back from there. Hopefully we'll be we'll be given some access to those views um, because it's always great to, to see us back on the moon. Um, but yeah, one, one final thing, a little update from the Ariane Space Vega launch failure last week. Um, it turns out that inverted cables on the rocket's upper stage control system caused the launcher to tumble, uh, which annoyingly means it was indeed human error, which caused the failure. Um, Ariane Space have pointed out that this failure has nothing to do with the failure from last year, and they do look to correct the issue for the future, obviously. Um, also, Emily's curse may be back, but we we don't have time to discuss it. So, um... <laughs> yeah, let's move on. <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> Seven here, fuel all is go. Four G, five point five cabin, oxygen go. All systems are go. A few weeks back, we talked about the start of The Right Stuff, the eight-part drama about the Mercury 7 astronauts on Disney+, Plus, which is loosely based on Tom Wolfe's book of the same name. Uh, the series is now over, and uh, we have some thoughts, which I'm sure we're going to share soon. Um, I, I personally am in a number of groups on Facebook, and this show does seem to have been quite divisive within those groups. I've seen some of the highest engagements uh, on, the, on posts about this, and uh, some have been quite firm in their opposition to the show. Um, so, Emily, what do you think about all this? Well, um, I can see maybe some of the opposition. There were some people who I thought were portrayed a little harsher than they were in real, than that they their behavior was in real life. However, it is also, um, it's a fictional, uh, there is a disclaimer at the beginning of the show, hey, there are fictionalized elements in this show, 
you know, while it is based on a book, there are, you know, things that were kind of dramatized. It's it's a dramatization. Yeah, you know? exactly. So um, I tried to watch it with an open mind as entertainment. Yes. Because, yeah, I, I tried not to get too nitpicky, even though, you know, there my mind was because I study this stuff. So I was kind of like, you know, your mind does start to say, well, this person would have never done that. This person would have never done that. This, you know, and you do get in that mind frame. But at the same time, I was just trying to soak it in as entertainment. Um, I did like the miniseries because... I completely missed that era oh, yeah. of, of of the United States, you know, kind of the late 50s, early 60s, you know, space age when the nation enjoyed kind of this, you know, new prosperity. People were getting houses and cars and stuff like that, you know, for a lot of them for the first time, you know, because they had the GI Bill and things like that. And um, I just kind of love that. You know, granted, I do want to point out that not everything in America was awesome during this period. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, want, I do want to point that out. You know, I mean, there were a lot of social problems that were not being addressed at that time. I don't want to make it like everything was, you know, rainbow and rainbows and unicorns because they weren't. But um, I, I like, you know, the kind of aesthetic from that period. And I do feel like it captured a certain mood of the time and definitely the appearance of the time and sort of that you know okay let's go conquer space attitude so i did i did enjoy it and like i said i i I tried to suspend my disbelief and just enjoy it as entertainment only i just think people in these groups they forget what what they're talking about sometimes this is a, a tv dramatization of an event and I think a lot of people, if you ask them, especially especially maybe the younger generation who aren't who weren't able to watch launches regularly, if you ask them how they got into space and things like that, it's from these kind of films or TV shows, be it Apollo 13, be it the original Right Stuff movie. They have the power to inspire someone to want to find out more uh, and then go away and do just that. I think what they've done well is they've also had this documentary at the end, which you wrote a very good article on, uh, the the real right stuff, um, which I will post a link to to Emily's article about that. But if you've watched the show, it comes up as a if you've watched this, you might like this this documentary, which then and that is very factual and it it shows what actually happened and and talks through it. And I think that's a clever way of doing it, saying okay, you may have enjoyed this this bit of fiction we've created based on this truth. So here's actually what happened and here's those people in real life. Uh, and there's some great stuff within that documentary. It's well worth well worth watching, whether, whether you're watching the TV show or not. But I know people who have watched this uh, and had no interest in spaceflight before this, thoroughly enjoyed it, wanted to know more about Al Shepard, wanted to know more about John Glenn, and have gone away and looked them up. In this, in this country at the moment, the front page of the newspaper seems to be about the crown because there's a whole princess diana thing over here where you can't ever say anything bad about her and of course <laughs> okay uh, this for to certain newspapers it's like she's on the front page every three days whether there's anything to report about or not even now tw- 20 odd years after she died um 23 years or whatever it is she's that big of a deal still to certain section of the population so the fact that the crown has portrayed her in a certain way it's a drama. It's it's not a documentary. But I've yeah, I watched The Crown, and it's it it's not it's not a historical doc- documentary. But it does highlight a few things, which every now and then I'm like, I had no idea about that. I don't take the TV show as gospel. I then go away and look it up and go, I'm gonna find out more about that. I had no idea that happened, and that's what most people do when they watch this. So of course, if you're already into it and you know the history. Yes, of course you might be like, well, that's not how it is, and you get a bit snobby about it. But don't forget that these kind of shows bring people into our world, and they bring people in and inspire people. And I think that's what people forget. Uh, and, and and you can say, look back, Apollo thirteen is is lauded as being the the the, the greatest of all films for, about space. But of course, it's riddled with inaccuracies as well. But we look over that because it's a great film and we love it. Yeah. And it's the same. It inspires people. And that's what you have to remember. It brings people in. If they then want to find out more about who Jack Swiger actually is and realize he's not the guy from Footloose, fantastic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? He's not Kevin Bacon. He's not Kevin Bacon. And, yeah, 
I get a bit annoyed. I don't never pipe up, but I do get annoyed. Sometimes I just think people need to just remember, okay, we get it. All right. <laughs> if you were never going to like this, so why are you now commenting on it? And I think the worst people online are the ones who, uh, <laughs> who say, I haven't watched it, but it looks awful. Brilliant. Great contribution to the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> I know. The people, I agree with you totally because I'm like, what? Like, you know, they'll be like, it looks terrible, but I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, great. You know, I remember um, a few years ago when Gravity came out and, you know, I I saw it in the theater and I think I saw it in 3D IMAX or Phenomenal. something like that. Yeah. And I, I found the effects really um, incredible, you know, and I, I found it was it was entertaining. It was entertainment. But, you know, people were just ripping it apart. Oh, this could never happen. I'm like, guys, it's a movie. Exactly. This didn't happen. Exactly. None of this happened. If I'm watching entertainment, I try to just switch off. sit back, relax, you know, and maybe get myself a, you know, a glass of Coke and bourbon or something and just chill. You know, I, I'm yeah, exactly. I'm trying to switch off, you know, unless it completely, you know, slanders somebody, which some uh, I won't get into it. Some forms of entertainment have, you know, gone. I'm like, OK, this person absolutely would not have done this. Yeah. But I mean, I, I really did not feel that way with this depiction of the right stuff so exactly exactly they they did portray Shepard as a jerk but to be fair in real life he could be a jerk i mean he so. was called the ice man yes <laughs> i mean we do we forget that like he he was a bit yeah he was hard he was hard work and that's how this betrays him and and but to me it's, it's just great to to have have a tv show with high production standards filmed in that world that we love, I can use this to bring other people into this world and hopefully they'll appreciate why I love what we love so much. Um, but a few weeks ago, I reached out to to one of the actors uh, in the show, Eric Ladin, uh, who plays Chris Craft on the show. And I, I asked him if he'd be up for coming on the pod to talk about the show and his involvement. And I'm delighted to say he said yes. So very late last Wednesday, Emily and I, uh, managed to catch up with him via Zoom. Uh, Roger, this is Liberty Bell 7. The clock is operating. Loud and clear, Jose. Don't cry too much. Okie doke. Eric Ladin, thanks very much for joining us. You've been an actor for a number of years and played many roles. Uh, but in the last two years, you've been cast as both Chris Craft in The Right Stuff and Gene Krantz in For All Mankind, two absolute titans in the history of mission control at NASA. Uh, we'll talk more about the roles in the shows later, but when I was doing my research, I noticed that you were from Houston. And mm. is it just a fun coincidence, or has NASA and Spaceflight always been a big part of your life? Thanks for having me, by the way. Happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know what? I think it's a coincidence. I mean, listen... When you grow up in Houston and NASA's in your backyard, you 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 know obviously it's something that you know about. There's regular field trips to NASA. Uh, if anything, perhaps I probably took it a little bit for granted because it was always just there. But you know, the my first real memory of space was not a positive one. It was the Challenger when I was in third grade, mm -hmm. and so and that's really the first like very vivid memory, strong memory I have of the space program because uh, the teacher had come to our school and meet and met with us uh, before the, 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 uh, the launch mm. as a, like a special speaker. You know, we were all gathered around. They brought the TV into the classroom and we were all around watching that happen. So that was, that was like kind of a, an odd introduction into a, I guess, a topic that I would be researching so much more later in life. But yeah, it certainly wasn't a positive one, but it was, that's what the one it was. <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to ask whether you used to have a lot of visits to the space center as, as, a, as yeah. a child. I, I, I assume sure. so. I'm really curious, like uh, what kinds of resources did you use when you were preparing uh, for your role as uh, Chris Kraft? I noticed that you got a lot of his, I mean, you look just like him on the show. Uh, you got a lot of his mannerisms down. Uh, you got his voice down. Did you watch any, you know, footage, like maybe archival footage of him in action or what and what like types of books or documents did you read? I'm just curious. So I, I started with his book um, and then I kind of moved into other books 
by some of the astronauts um, that talk about him um, because I think it's so important to to see how other people view the character that you're about to play because that informs a lot of times how other people obviously saw him as opposed to how he saw something happening. You know, he had some interesting stories in his books. He was not a fan of, of Carpenter. He was not a, necessarily a fan of Glenn, to be honest with you. Like he and Glenn respected each other. He got along with Glenn. I shouldn't say got along. He respected him very much. He knew he was great at his job, but years earlier when Chris was at NACA uh, as an engineer for the test pilots, uh, he and John had run in, run into, you know, a little bit of a disagreement on how to solve some problems. And so he had always kind of seen John Glenn as a bit of a stubborn kind of hard headed pilot. And so, you know, like I tried to bring that into this series a little bit beyond reading the books. I watched interviews with him, uh, many of which were later in life, but I still was able to get a lot of information and then uh, Robert Yole, who is, uh, was our technical advisor, who's fantastic and has a brilliant career uh, in space, he was able to find uh, footage of Shepard's flight from Mercury Control. And so it's about 30 minutes of footage, and it's, it's fascinating to watch. There's no sound, but you can really watch the mannerisms of not only craft, but the guys in the room, you can sense the tension, but you can also sense the ease of which they go about their business. Everybody, you know, it's like ants and they're all kind of doing their job and, you know, it's, uh, and leading up to it very casual and smoking. And then as it gets closer, you can see the tension build just visually. And, and so those kind of things really, you know, start to influence decisions I make and choices I make as an actor. Okay. Yeah. And as as we've already discussed a little bit, you also played uh, Gene Kranz uh, on uh, For All Mankind. And uh, here's a unfortunate spoiler for those who have not watched For All Mankind. Uh, Gene Kranz uh, dies en route to trying to get a cheeseburger on that <laughs> show, unfortunately. Um, did you do anything different when you were preparing to play uh, Gene Kranz on that show? Uh, obviously... Gene's trajectory is a little different on For All Mankind yeah. than it was in real than it is in real life. Yeah, he's he's still walking around. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's still around, y'all. <laughs> yeah, he's still around, y'all. Um, you know, <laughs> listen, I okay. So Gene Kranz, that role I played first, and that role came to me. Um, of course, played beautifully by Ed Harris in in Apollo thirteen in the film, and I read his book did all the same sort of things. When they talked to me about, because of the nature of For All Mankind and because it's a fictional show, you know, because of where it was going to go, you know, I was kind of bummed because I, I really enjoyed the space. I enjoyed learning about this and I wanted to live in that world. Mm. You know, it just happened to be a coincidence that then the right stuff called and they sent me this to look at. And at first I was like, no, you know, I can't go from this to this. It's just too similar. And, but then I really started to like dig in. And first of all, the script for the right stuff, the pilot was just brilliantly written. And I met with the director and I met with the creators and, and it was so, I, I had a feeling it would be so well crafted that I, I, no pun intended, <laughs> but I, but I felt like, you know what? I felt like I had, I had unfinished business to do, and this was going to be a way for me to do that. But, but it did mean that I was going to have to work really diligently for anybody who watches both shows, for anybody who loves space and loves this, this genre. I didn't want them to watch this and go, well, that's just him with, a, with dark hair and a different haircut. You know, I, I really wanted to do what I could to try to make sure I differentiated the two. And, and, you know, I hope I did that. You know, I, I don't know. I hope I oh, did Oh, yeah. That. You definitely did because it took me a few episodes to realize – it was the same actor who was Gene Krantz as who was Chris Craft, and then it blew my mind. I was like, "What?" I appreciate how, that. How, and, and so that's obviously your craft. There, uh, no pun intended. There you uh, go. It, <laughs> we'll see how that. many times we can do that. Yeah, tonight. Exactly. Exactly. Right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you have any favorite moments from making either either of the shows? I, mean, I, I think particularly with the right stuff because we're focusing on that this week in the podcast. But uh, there, were there any standout moments in making it? Or with, uh, I, I don't know if you actually are someone who watches your work afterwards, but if then watching back, you've, you're like, yes, that's great. I love how that's turned out. 
I do watch my work. I'm not an actor that uh, it, most of it. I mean, not all of it, but I but I do tend to watch certainly shows like this. I'm I'm highly critical of it. I see things. I have to watch it a couple times, which is a shame because the show is good. But you know, with the right stuff, uh, this the relationship that I got to build with Deke Slayton was one that I really appreciated. The writers honoring uh, Deke and Chris were very close. Uh, it was obviously very difficult for him to share the news that he was going to be sidelined. I, I had, in hindsight, wish we had gotten to do a little bit more together uh, leading up to that. But I thought that in all in all, it turned out really well. Um, so those scenes I thought were really lovely scenes uh, that were well written. I had a ball uh, in episode. Episode four is an episode that is kind of wild for me because um, Von Brown is there and we're and and shit's going haywire and I I you know he's <laughs> got somebody going to pull a gun out to shoot the rocket which of course in real life didn't happen but the way we kind of justify that is that there were people that probably in the blockhouse that wanted to do that and that's the way I felt so of course I would never have tackled him <laughs> but again that was in Kraft's that's what Kraft probably would have wanted to do so you know that's how we justify those things for television. But but that scene, I jumped in a Jeep and I flew down, you know, uh, we were there. I mean, we actually shot that stuff at the actual blockhouse. Oh, it's wow. the first time that they have ever allowed a production to shoot in the blockhouse. And so we were sitting there working 500 feet from the launch pad in, in the blockhouse. I mean, it was That's remarkable. Amazing. It's just unbelievable. And, and the Navy... Uh, or excuse me, I believe it's the Air Force who owns it. Let us do it. You know, it's just when you're when you're shooting around that piece of history, it's it's really it's it's breathtaking. So the, those kind of moments were really cool for me. You know, to be able to walk in that blockhouse and you know with the thick glass and the and you looked and the in the the restored computers, um, but the original computers. You know, they were only, I, you guys certainly know this, but I always found this fascinating that at that time, the blockhouse was 500 feet away. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, well, why in the world would they be five? Why, I mean, let's go a little further. <laughs> you know what I mean? But they actually, when, it, when you hit the red button, there was an actual wire that went to the rocket <laughs> to launch it. And that's as long as the wire would go. <laughs> so that's why they were 500 feet. They couldn't do it any further or it wouldn't work. It blows your mind at how little technology they had and how much they accomplished. Mm. And so moments like that are the ones in that show that really stand out to me, you know, as kind of special moments when we were shooting. That's, a, that's certainly an episode that Emily and I really enjoyed. Yes. Um, <laughs> and and the, the relationship between you and uh, you and Deke, I also really enjoyed. Um, I, I will say, I think you absolutely nailed Chris Craft from the moment you first walk in. It's like, well, he's playing Chris Craft. That's that's who that is. Before your name even got mentioned, you absolutely embodied uh, Chris in a way I've never seen him portrayed, uh, which you. which I really enjoyed. A Emily, I'm gonna let you answer this question because it's <laughs> okay. This, this is I one. Can't... This is one we've enjoyed. This is um, this is what right. we enjoyed. <laughs> Please. So, um, I'm just I'm just curious. Uh, why is Alan Shepard in the show? Why is he? shirtless so often um <laughs> like is that part of his contract or something and um what are your thoughts on this because i've noticed that i'm like what are they doing like alan shepherd is like ripped <laughs> yeah what is up with this does he go to like space shirtless next episode what's tell me more let's, what's going on let's let's hope not i mean <laughs> you know emily I think they do it for the ladies. You know what I mean? I, um, I'm not listen, upset. I'm not offended right. by it. Yeah. No, no. Jake is a, uh, Jake is a, has a fantastic body. Uh, if that's what you're into. And, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, you know, listen, those are also decisions that come from upstairs. Uh, not ones that I always necessarily agree with. Uh, some of the execs, thought that it'd be a good idea to uh to have scenes like that so i think also to be honest with you i think that it even when we were you know we were originally going to be on nat geo and then they flipped yeah. it over to disney uh but e e even on nat geo unlike an hbo or showtime or cinemax or whatever you can't show a lot of stuff 
And so yeah. Shepard was quite the womanizer. And Shepard oh, was yeah. quite the ladies man. Mm -hmm. And so although Shepard in real life didn't look like Jake, um but that being <laughs> said, I I think it's probably a little bit of a, a of a way to without showing you so much of the actions that Shepard might have taken behind closed door, which you might be able to do on other networks. This was a way to kind of like lean into that. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. actually. I think it was kind of to show maybe he was a little bit vain. Totally vain. Well, he certainly is. Mm. And that's for that's for sure. Um, you know, but in a very like kind of tortured way, you know? Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting, you know, one of the things about this show and really Tom Wolf, it, 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 he does such an incredible job at writing character and, and just the conflict and the battle between you know, these guys and what they deal with. And certainly when you bring life magazine into it, you bring the press into it and what the public wants. And they're, I mean, they're the first celebrities. They're the first reality show. Right. And, and that's not what they were meant to be doing. They were meant to be no. racing Corvettes and you know, everything <laughs> else. And that's how they kind of kept their edge, if you will. But yet they needed to portray a completely different life, uh, you know, to the, to the media. I mean, it's it's scary actually how much that is still re relative today, which is kind of frightening. Yeah, yeah. With social media, very very scary. Um, we have a Patreon page, and we ask our top tier subscribers to yeah. submit questions for our guests. And uh, and Lauren has, has submitted this question, which which I really like. So I I wanted to share this one with you. Obviously, uh, right stuff is is a dramatized story, uh, dramatized true story, and for all my mankind is an alternative history history. Uh, featuring real life characters. As an actor, is it easier or harder to portray someone who is real where there is expectation of how they look, uh, sound, or react, uh, or to play a fictional character where the audience has no reference with what they're watching? It's it's a great question, and it's kind of I, I think you could ask you could ask a bunch of actors and get different answers, and I think it's also circumstantial. I've had I'll say the fortune of playing a lot of wonderful people in my career, from J. Edgar Hoover to some really incredible mm. veterans, you know, who are walking and breathing this and, and you know, obviously craft and crayons. The, the one thing you get that makes it easier is that you, there's usually a lot of information about them. And so I can read books. I can you know, listen to interviews. I can watch interviews. I can possibly interview people. I, in in some situations, I could actually meet the person. But then after that, it becomes harder because then you really have to, you have to do all that you can to embody this person, but you at some point have to let go of it and just know that you're not necessarily doing an imitation of this person. You're, you're just representing them. Um, you know, when I played Hoover... Mm. I didn't have brown eyes. I didn't. I, in fact, Kraft doesn't have blue eyes. You know what I mean? Uh, there are certain things that I, I could with contacts and all sorts of things. But really and truly, it's about a representation of that person. So you have to kind of once you've mm. gotten all the information, you have to let go and just trust that the, your representation is going to do it justice. Um, and, and the other hard thing is that people have something to relate it to. They, they've they seen Kraft. They've seen Kranz. They've seen, you know, Hoover or whatever it is. Um, on the flip side, when you get to play a fictional character, you get to kind of make it all up. But the the pre-production stuff becomes mm. a lot harder because now you're you don't have a book to go to. So you're really having to like come up with this stuff with the writer or the filmmaker on your own. So it, it's a little it's you know, it's a it's a great question, but I think you know, sometimes the pre-production is easier on one and then the actual, you know, choices are easier on the other, if that makes sense at all. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Probably depends on the character as well. Totally depends on the character. Yeah. I was interested in what you said about like, uh, you know, you're not playing dress up or something like that, because like I've seen and uh, not on the right stuff, but I've, I've, you know, I've seen some movies where, you know, I don't want to say specific names because it'll sound like I'm ragging on people, but it's like they're trying to play a specific historical, like a character and it's an imitation. Mm -hmm. uh, like it, they're not really embodying that the spirit of that person it's like they're dressed up and they sound like mm -hmm. them i don't know that to me there's like i can tell a difference when 
somebody's trying to emulate somebody and when somebody's really trying to get into it. I don't know. Yeah, Does that make sense? And, no, it, it, it makes total sense. And I, I think it's a delicate balance. I mean, you, you want to go as far as you can without doing a caricature um, of that person. Uh, because at some point you start becoming affected, right? You just start leaning on a lisp or a wardrobe or a mannerism as opposed to actually having living and breathing thoughts as that person reacting to the way they, you, you are going to hope they react in that situation. But, but certainly that, that does make playing a real person more difficult because, there's references. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, technical director. I, I've already forgotten the guy's name. You said for for the right stuff, Robert Yole. Robert Yole. Um, th- did you also have a, a, a different technical director for for All Mankind? And I did. Uh, yeah, there was somebody different on that. Um, how how much of a role do they play? Obviously, you, you gave a one specific example with how Robert helped uh, helped you with the character. But are they on set a lot on, at the time? Are they are they informing decisions uh, that made by the characters and the director, or are they a bit standoffish? Is it more of a pre production job, and then and then they're out? So in pre production, they help greatly. You know, they they I you know they'll the writers will send them scripts can you go through this mission control dialogue make sure this is all copacetic make sure this all works you know he goes back they would never say this this person doesn't say this this is not you know no um so that's how it starts in pre-production and then during production it i'm guessing it depends on how much the actor wants to lean on that technical advisor i'm always like a sponge just taking as much information as i can ideally going to dinner with them outside a set to talk about stories because a lot of times I'll get information that way when you're not in a work environment. You know, you you kind of just talking to them, you get stories. Robert was great. He actually had a an original, mer- if you look closely in episode, uh, in, the, in the ham launch, I believe. Uh, so that's episode... Six. six yeah mm-hmm. I, I i'm wearing a uh a mercury pin that that actually is a real uh was an original mercury oh, wow. pen that he had had because he's he's kept some some stuff and collected some stuff over the years and, and just to put into perspective for your listeners how much work goes into this and how these props departments just work their tails off to make these sets look as authentic as they can gene Cran's had a lighter. There was a picture they found of him with a lighter. There was a uh, lighter that all of the flight op- um, uh, flight operators in control got from the Apollo 8 or Apollo 9. I don't remember which one, but they had all gotten this lighter, Zippo lighter with this Apollo insignia, that badge on it. There was only about 35 made, 40 made. They found one. Wow. An original. And I used it as crayons to light my cigarettes, like in the show. <laughs> That's amazing. And yeah, they let me keep a replica, not the actual original, but they made three or four replicas, uh, and I, which I got to keep one. Um, but it's just that that's the kind of detail, the level of detail that goes into to what these guys do. And it's really incredible. And, and Robert was extremely beneficial. I lean on those guys often. You know, I, I'll be I, I like them to be on set. I often tell the producers, directors, I want them on set when we shoot these days because I lean on them. I will oftentimes after we start sta- blocking or staging, however you want to, you know, for your listeners, like when we start working it out, I'll say to them, would Fido be there? Like, I feel like Fido wouldn't be there. No, Fido would actually be over here. But because this actor is playing Fido, we need the camera to be there. So we got to kind of fudge it a little bit. Okay. You know, all the minute, little things that I need to know that I wouldn't know and I need them on a moment's notice, I can go to him and ask him. That's that's very um, cool. Yeah. And Robert actually knew both Gene and Chris. So he, I leaned on heavily as well at the beginning of the process. I, I went to him and I said, listen, we're going to talk about this tonight over dinner. And then after this dinner, we're never saying Gene Kranz's name again because I can't go. Th- like, I've left that project. I need to focus strictly on Chris Craft. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to ever talk about it, hear about it, know about it. Like, 
he, we're in 59. That guy doesn't even exist in my brain. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Like that was the other thing I had to go backwards because I played 69 first and now I'm going in 59. So like those things don't exist. Mm. Right. But I had already just gotten off a set where they do exist. So I had to kind of like figure out a way to forget all those things. When you are taken on a role like this, obviously the fact that you've done two of these now might help, but there is a lot of jargon. There is a lot of acronyms and things like that. Are you the kind of person that does want to know what they all mean? Or are you happy just to be told you deliver it like this and not no. worry too, not worry too much? No, about, no, no. You have to know that. what something means. You have to. And and I and I've played military and a lot and space a lot. I mean, you you have to know what it means, otherwise you don't know what you're saying. Yeah. You have to be able to unpack what does this mean? Who am I talking to? What am I say? like you have to. It, for me, I don't know how an actor would be able to do otherwise. Uh, Emily and I are in a number of groups on Facebook, and em Emily actually runs one of the one of the biggest space groups on Facebook. Whenever there's a TV show, which is a a, a dramatized version of things that we know as history, um, uh -huh. within these groups with the hardcore space fans, there are obviously some dissenting opinions about these of things. Course. Nitpickers. Yeah, I mean, these people are never probably gonna be. Uh, please with anything unless it's a full on documentary and even then they're going to find flaws in it do you worry about those kind of people or or that kind of thing when you're getting involved in a project like this or do you just literally who are you who do you feel like you're aiming this at because my girlfriend who's not really into space has loved the right stuff and is now asking me more questions about what actually happened than she's ever done before and I always point that out to people that as a kid, Apollo 13 is one of the reasons I'm so into it. Mm -hmm. So therefore, these things are important. When you're in the project, is that what you're thinking? Or are you trying to please everyone? Which is obviously impossible to do. I mean, I mean, I think you answered, I think you answered the question. Those people aren't going to be pleased regardless. Mm. Right. So you, you can't try to please those people. Um, you know, and 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 no disrespect. I I get it. I mean, I you know, listen, I watch, I, I love sports, huge sports fan. And when I see certain things in movies that are not like really crisp, right? Really, whether I, it's an actor who I clearly can tell doesn't know how to shoot a basketball or mm -hmm. the way somebody said something, it's, it bumps a little bit, right? That's a term we use, right? It bumps yeah. a little bit. But I also, you, you got to remember that it's it's entertainment, right? We're we're doing the best that we can to tell a story, you know. So if, if that's what you're looking for, there's nothing wrong with it. But th then it's going to be it's not for you, right? Yeah. Um, I I hope that people can watch it that are space fans with a sense of enjoyment, and I think there are space fans that probably can, and then I think there are space fans that just say no way, no way, they're all too good looking especially that craft guy um <laughs> no they um, they would have never this would have never happened they would have never done that and and, and that's and that's true you know i don't there is a cult because of chris craft on the show but i don't want to discuss this man it's too much it is it, because he's too good looking in the yeah. show hot chris craft is? hot chris craft is definitely being discussed <laughs> online he's called hot chris craft he was not on anybody's yeah. bingo he was not on anybody's bingo card yeah. this year because the real yeah, Chris Craft was a little terrifying. <laughs> so, like, the real one yeah, yeah. scared me a oh, little bit. Oh, I love you it. Know? But but now but now we're all looking back at real Chris Craft again. Did we miss something? Hot? Did we just not see it before? We just didn't uh, see it. See? But it's a you know like uh, it's a representation. You know, yeah. it's a it's a representation. And and um, uh, listen, I I I hope that people can enjoy. But you can't you can't go through life trying to please everybody. Uh, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I I ho I hope. I hope they do. Um, and, and to all all of the fans and listeners from from your Facebook page and all of them, you know, I guess I would just say, like, I totally get it. I totally get it. Um, uh, the dissension or, that, you know, I, I totally understand that. A lot of that happens at a level that's, um, again, far above me. Yeah. And they're thinking of the broader spectrum and, and you know, it's not made for a, a small little group of 5,000, you know, yeah. it, they spend too much money on it. It's mm -hmm. got to be made for 500,000, five, you know, like 
50 million. Yeah. You know, that's who it's made for. That's what they're, they're trying to get 30 million, 50 million views. Yeah. You know, so yeah. that's, that's who it's. Made oh, for. understood. Absolutely. And, and as I said, yeah. it, it does work. It does get people more interested in the history and, and, the, and then look up. What did Alan Shepard look like with his shirt off? <laughs> oh, okay. Not that. Not, not, yeah, that. not, not quite there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. And where's Jake's gap in his teeth? Because yeah. Shepard had big, huge gap yeah. in his teeth. He did indeed. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. Th th those things don't bother me at all. I, I, I really have enjoyed the show. I hope there is a season two. And I hope we see more of you Appreciate on the screen. It. Uh, and, and and going forward. And thank yes, you so much you. for joining us on this podcast and uh, and giving up your time. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it very much. Yep. Thank you. Have a Take great care. night. Thank you. Oh, that view is tremendous. That was awesome, and that was a lot of fun. He was a very good sport about the hot Chris Kraft stuff. <laughs> I was afraid he would hear about that and just be like, I'm out of here. The like, thing is, he set us up for it. He set us up for it, really, didn't he? He did! We, went, we said beforehand, don't bring it up. And then he made a joke about him making Chris Kraft better looking. And the looks on our faces at that point was just gold. It was like, we have to do it now. <laughs> we have to mention it. <laughs> I think it was when he slammed the German to a ground. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm all for it. I'm good with this. Like, dang, that's sexy. Like, I'm good. Following you on social media when you were watching those episodes was one of the was one of the highlights of the last couple of months for me. You were absolutely amazing with with your content there, Emily. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that scene with the Jeep and he was just like, I ain't gonna take it. I'm gonna slam one of these Von Brown's boys to the ground. I was like, you go. Like I was like, oh my God, woo. Like, geez. I don't know. So yeah. And all of a sudden I was like, you know, Chris Kraft wasn't so bad looking in real life. And it's like, why am I looking at him like this? Oh my God. <laughs> You know, like I've never looked at him like that before. Mainly, I used to be just terrified of him. Like that's the picture you put up when you're trying to scare. Like, you know, if you have a bug in your house, you're trying to scare it. Yeah. Like that's the picture you put up. No, all of a sudden it's like, what? Uh, what is this? No, but seriously though, um, he was a really great sport, and uh, I don't know what what kind of insights did you gain from him in that interview? I I, I personally gained a lot of insight and in how how he actually prepared for it because. He was he was very serious about it. Yeah, I, I'm. I was impressed with his knowledge uh, and and the fact that he had taken it seriously and not just that role, the Gene Kranz role as well in in For Mankind. And he did appreciate the differences and actually was learning the history as well. And as and as and and that this the process of him doing this seems to have inspired him to want to know more about it and more learn more about these people and do a good job in portraying them and. And I, I wasn't just trying to blow smoke up his bum. The reason the reason I reached out to him rather than anyone else in the show is because I generally think that he has been the highlight of the of the show in his depiction. And it's not an imitation. It's just he seemed to embody what I imagine Chris Craft to be. That episode that kind of focuses in on him a little bit, the, the and with the volleyball scene. That's that episode is incredible, and and you are in no doubt that that is Chris Craft. I also. Love the fact that they did it in Florida right? and, and got to use yeah. some of those original sites. I think that's wonderful as well. Yeah, I really, I really liked it. And like you said, I was, uh, yeah, when he first showed up on the show, I was like, oh my God, that's Chris Kraft. Like it, it looks, I mean, and it wasn't just the way he looked, it was the way he carried himself. Yeah. Like, okay, that's, that's, he's in charge. It, you know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that guy's in charge. So, um, yeah, he was a great sport. Uh, we had an awesome time talking to him. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, for the purposes of this podcast, uh, unfortunately, we had to trim it down the chat we had with him down a bit. But um, if you are on our Patreon page, you can hear the full unedited uh, interview, which is at uh, patreon.com slash space and things. Yeah, actually, I might I might upload the video if that's all right with you, Emily, uh, because I think it, it's fun to see our reaction to things as well. You and I seem to be having a good time in that as well. So, uh, yeah, the, the yeah, video will also be on fun. that Patreon. Um and All right. uh, and we'll we'll also in the show links uh, in the show notes we'll post links to Eric's Instagram. Uh, but yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed that, and um, he also div divulged to us uh, that the plan with the right stuff is to bring uh, to bring it right up through the shuttle era to highlight the U.S. space program in f in full. But obviously, he pointed out that he's just the actor, and the decisions on that are, are way above his pay grade. Uh, but he's really hopeful there'll at least be a season two following through through the end of the Mercury program. So thanks Eric for coming on and for answering our questions. Yes. And thanks to you for listening to and for supporting the podcast. Um, 
There are plenty of ways you can help us out, and many of you do, so thank you. Um, please consider buying one of our t-shirts or joining our Patreon if you haven't done so already. Or you can help us out just by clicking the share button. Yeah, that's right. Feel free to let all your friends know about this podcast. And we hope to be bringing you more interviews and insight every week. Uh, so thanks for tuning in. And remember, in space, no one can hear you mean. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.